thank you for everyone for joining today's webinar. I will now turn it over to Bill Heaven. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to HPK's monthly risk advisory webinar series. Um, as, as we just said, uh, my name is Bill Heaven. I'm a senior manager here with HPK in our uh, risk advisory services practice. And like uh, Michelle just said, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be discussing what I think is a very prominent uh, topic. It's the um, Verizon 2021 Data Breach Investigations Report, which is also known as the DBIR. Um, we're going to cover the cybersecurity threats that organizations are facing, um, and we'll also provide some suggestions on how to how you can mitigate these risks. Um, before we get really into the DBIR, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping logistical issues. So we just uh, switched over to a, uh, a new CPE um, uh, clearinghouse. I'm not sure what they're what they're actually referred to. So today's presentation is going to be eligible for CPE one hour. In order to obtain the CPE credit, you're going to need to remain on the presentation for the entire session and then answer three content sensitive questions that will be included within the presentation. And then we have a fourth question that comes up and just asks, do you want CPE or not, yes or no? And that, um, that's been working out better than us having people email us and say, hey, give me CPE. So all you have to do is answer that fourth question as, as to if you want CPE. Um, we have all the incoming lines muted. So if you do experience any uh, problems, you can communicate with our webinar monitor, Michelle, through the chat window. And we're gonna plan to leave about five to 10 minutes to answer your questions at the end of the presentation. So you can submit questions ahead of time, just if, if we're talking about something that uh, jars uh, uh, um, things to, to come up with a question, you can go ahead and type that in ahead of time. Also in the meeting, um, the message meeting control center, we have a PDF copy of today's presentation that you can download. And we are going to be uh, recording the webinar and we'll provide links to the recording after the webinar for those uh, people that registered for today's webinar. And our agenda is as it is up on the screen there. We're gonna talk a little bit about the background, key takeaways from this year's report, some of the uh, highlights of by industry, um, how you can use this towards doing your own IT risk assessment, which was last month's webinar, um, and then some risk mitigation recommendations and a roundup, wrap up, I should say, not roundup. As I said before, um, I'm Bill Heaven, I'm a senior manager here at HBK. I have a dual role. So I, I do work with external clients who are a risk advisory practice. I also have responsibilities internal for our IT security here at HBK. So I actually use the, the DBIR um, to help, uh, help us evaluate our own risks that we're exposed to and, and try to uh, figure out how to best mitigate those risks. Okay, so I, like I said, we switched over to a um, a new uh, advisory um, organization to be able to issue CPE, and uh, so we're starting to transition and um, wanted to include the uh, learning objectives. This is a, a basic, um, would be considered a basic course, and there's no prerequisites. And then the, um, the five learning objectives of being able to recognize some of the terminology identify takeaways, recognize industry highlights, um, apply inputs for your own risk assessment, and then uh, identify some of the risk mitigation recommendations as put forth in the uh, Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report. So again, the, um, I'm gonna go through some background just to give you some um, so you can ground yourself in what, what's going on with the Verizon DBIR. Some people have heard, heard about the Verizon DBIR. Others are, are not gonna be even aware that it's, um, it existed. Um, I think I, 
um, I was thinking when I was preparing for this webinar earlier this week that um, I think I'm officially a, a computer geek because I was actually looking forward to the, uh, the release of the Verizon um, data breach investigations report, which it was released. It gets released in May every year, and I was I was waiting and, and checking the website all the time to see if it was issued yet, and it, it actually got issued on the 13th of May this year. So been out for just um, just under two weeks. Um, as, as you can see here on the, the screen, they've, they've made some incre improvements this year. This is actually the 14th annual edition. So this, this report's been coming out. You know, this is the uh, 14th consecutive report. And um, Verizon, although they it, it's a really valuable report, report, it gives you a lot of great information. And um, they continue to upgrade it. It's it's a little. Um, they made some changes here this year that that gave me a little bit of a headache when I was trying to make this presentation. Because what I I'm not sure how many people that are online now actually attended. I try to do this um, annually, so I did a Verizon report on the uh, 2020 um, the 2020 report, which does it the year before, back uh, last summer. So I tried to use a similar format so that people that attended both would have some way to compare the, uh, the two reports. And and so they, they've updated a few things this year that's, that made it a little more um, difficult than you would expect to to do that um, apples to apples comparison. But um, um, so one of the things they did change is they, they upped the industries from um, 18 to 20. Uh, the contributing organization, which is on a global basis, um, they got two extra contributing organizations, which uh, I actually have a, a contact here in Northeastern Ohio. It's a forensic um, shop that actually is a uh, Verizon contributing organization. So it's, um, it's pretty cool that we have one of those 83 is here in Northeastern Ohio. Um, and then they, they go through every year they take their incidents and then they have it has to meet a certain quality standard to be considered an incident and then actually have to have confirmed data loss, which I'll go through those definitions of incident and uh, breach in a couple of slides here. But um, these, these numbers are, uh, I think their quality standards um, were tweaked up a little bit this past year because the uh, number of incidents that they examined was um, was less on 2021's report than what it was on 2020, um, 2020's report, which was actually 2019. Um, this is one of the, the big changes is that they call, they refer to these as patterns. So they try to, which this is one of the things that makes, makes it interesting and makes it valuable for the Verizon report is that um, they actually do this categorization and try to put things into meaningful buckets so that you can analyze it. Because you've got somewhere usually on an annual basis. This year was right around 80,000 incidents. Last year, I think, was almost double that. So you've got a lot of incidents and then what, what they boil down to a breach. So it's to try to make it useful, it, the, these categories really help. So they've They've, they've accepted these um, with basically seven um, patterns. And then um, there's a, the reason why there's eight up there is because you get a lot of these little little nicky nacky ones where they don't want to get too many patterns out there. So they just have this uh, everything else pattern and dump dump everything in there. So so this was a, a change with the, along with the uh, industries that uh, was upgraded for this year. Like I said, um, they have a specific definition of an incident, which um, which you have to has to meet this definition on the screen here, where it compromises the integrity, confidentiality, or availability. For some of you that have been doing a lot of reading in the um, IT security area, this um, that's also referred to as the um, if you put it in a little bit of different order, if, uh, a lot of times you'll see it confidentiality, integrity, or availability. And it's, it's often referred to as the CIA triad. It has nothing to do with the um, intelligence service of our, our government. 
but it's just the integrity to make sure things don't get altered without permission, confidentiality, things don't get distributed or uh, disseminated without the proper permission and then the availability that you've got your computer systems available when you need them. Um, and then a breach, again, this, the specific definition, you see that it's confirmed disclosure. So it's not just potential because a lot of people, and this is, this gets pretty interesting. We've, we've had Joe Brunsman talk with us for a number of times. And, um, you know, he does cybersecurity insurance and it's, it's big on, you know, what, what insurance companies are going to cover. And that, and so it comes down to stuff like this is, you know, sometimes companies think they're exposed, but they're not sure. So Verizon just makes sure that you actually have a confirmed, um, disclosure of, of uh, data. And then the industries. We, we went up from from 18 last year to 20. Now, what this is, is there, there's 20 um, industry codes up there, and the number in parentheses is there, it's called the NAICS, or North American Industry, Industry, Industry Classification System. So it's N-A-I-C-S, but it's pronounced NAICS, just like um, BAKES with an N. And the number is the actual category. And so you, you have, um, that could be up to a five or six digit number. And I've just put the first two digits, which is considered the sector. But um, just uh, for your own edification, the uh, first two are the sector. Then you have a third digit, which is a subsector, fourth digit industry group, fifth digit, the actual industry, and then um, the sixth digit is the national industry if that if that happens. And the other thing to keep in mind is this NAICS code is used by the United States, Mexico, and Canada. Um, so it's uh, another another way to kind of categorize things and make them make sense. So we're going to go to our first um, CP checkpoint question. So Michelle will load that for you, and then we'll uh, give you a chance to. Uh, to answer those questions. Michelle, just let me know when we've, looks like we've gotten um, everybody's answers. We want to give everybody a chance to get, get an hour's worth of CPE today. All right, I closed the first poll. You can go ahead, Bill. Okay, thanks, Michelle. All right, so so moving on, uh, wrapping up our, our background section. So a lot of people wonder, you know, why, what's so special about the, the DBIR? And um, it's, it's actually pretty interesting reading. Um, I would recommend reading the, and we'll get to this in a couple of slides, but I would recommend reading the executive summary over the full full um, version report. But um, for those of you that were, were able to attend last month's um, webinar on performing a risk assessment, you know that you got down into the thing where you have to identify your risks and then analyze your risks as far as the likeliness. We'll cover this a little bit later in the report, but sometimes it's a pretty time consuming process to, to go through that that pro, you know, that actually doing that and trying to figure out what your threats are. So you look at the Verizon um, data breach, not as predicting what's going to happen, but it's just like you've got 80, 80 some companies that are validating incidents and breaches, and then their Verizon is taking that information and categorizing it. So you've got a global outlook that says, you know, what, what, which patterns, we had patterns up on the screen a few slides ago, are the most probable to, to happen. And then you can take a look at, it breaks it down into the industry. So you can, based on a, the NAICS code, you can look at your own industry and 
how they do the what industries they do the breakout reports on and try to figure out what the most likely who's coming after you like what um what attack internal external what you know what what your industry faces more um what patterns are the most likely in your industry and then what are the motives that the people that are attacking your industry what are they using and you can kind of like not it's not you're predicting but everybody has a everybody has a limited budget or at least most everybody has a limited budget so you take a look at what verizon puts out and they, they do quite a bit of work on this and it it gives you some some areas to focus on again not trying to predict the future but just you know more probable events based on what others in your industry are seeing and you can kind of allocate your budget dollars in those directions to uh to be able to make more sense of, of what's going on. So um, and that's one of the biggest advantages I see of, of how, you know, why you should pay attention to the Verizon um, data breach investigations report. So where can you get a, a version of the DBIR? I've put the, uh, the URLs there and you can pretty much just do a, um, Google search, whatever your search engine of choice is, um, just do the 2021 Verizon DBIR and it'll, it should bring stuff up and actually go right to the uh, enterprise.verizon.com website. And like I said, I would recommend downloading both of them. Um, the executive summary, I believe, is 19 pages long and the full version is around 100 pages more close to 119, 120 pages. So, but again, the the executive summary is a quick read and it, it gives you a good high level understanding of what's in the report. And then if you want any additional details, you can just dig into it in the full version. But um, use those slide, use those URLs to obtain the reports. And then this is the actual, I did a screen grab of what, when I did that, um, 2021 Verizon DVIR. And again, I would recommend just looking at the, um, you could view it online, but I would recommend the downloads. So the, uh, the second and the third um, options there of the download DVIR and then download the executive summary. Let's now I'll, I'll move on to some key takeaways from this year's report. That's uh, again, Tried to tried to make this somewhat similar to uh, to last year's report, and so what was very evident this year is that um, this 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 trend continued that breaches are almost always due to external financially motivated actors. Um, this trend has been consistent over time for about the last three or four or five years. It's, it's always been the same. Um, and it's, um, if anybody's been paying attention to cybersecurity news, everybody probably on this call has heard about the uh, Colonial Pipeline that was the victim of the ransomware attack from the Russian or the Russians. And it's not the government, but it's believed to be that it's organized crime, Russian, organized, the Russian mafia, basically. So this is, um, reaches a continue to be external and organized crime is, is a big chunk of, of who's doing all these, all these attacks. So, um, again, that's no surprise. And, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about ransomware lately, but, uh, ransomware, um, it's one of the biggest, um, out there. It's, increased in 2021 report over the uh, year before so it's um it's going to be something that we're we're talking about for probably a few more years to come all right so the main reason for most of the breaches again it's financial gain last year the statistic was um 86 percent of breaches were a result of um, people looking for a financial gain to basically make a quick buck on it. And that's um, that's up higher 
Um, the report didn't give a specific number, but it just showed a graph um, going up to the right. So it's it's higher than 86% from um, from last year. And everybody thinks that espionage is the big thing, but um, that's really a small um, small percentage of the breaches. Okay, so now we'll, we'll do a couple slides here. Good news, bad news based on the takeaways. And like I said, ransomware attacks have basically doubled in frequency from last year. Um, it's in the, this, for the Verizon study, 10% of the population of their study was uh, impacted by ransomware. And the thing that I, I wanna stress is that Previously, everybody was under the impression that, oh, I'm, I got hit by a ransomware attack. Somebody's going to be encrypting my data. And then if I pay a ransom or revert back to my last good backup and then rebuild from the backup, I don't have to pay the ransom, but I'll, I'll, I'll be good. So actually, um, if you've heard me speak before, you've heard me talk about um, the hackers being like scum of the earth and and trying to really um, do as little work as possible and that ransomware is sometimes run as a business where they have their own help desks and everything to help you get, figure out how to get cryptocurrency to pay them and et cetera, et cetera. So ransomware, the, the people that are doing this um, are, we're figuring out that people were, one of the things I was recommending all the time was make sure your backups are good so that you can uh, revert back and then use a business continuity plan to, to fill in the gap there and you should be good. But um, so people, I guess, uh, generally weren't paying the ransoms. So what did the uh, ransomware industry do to adapt? They started, in addition to encrypting your data, they steal it and then they threaten you. They say, all right, if you're not going to pay the ransom, we're not only not going to give you your, encryption key to get your data back but we're going to post all your data online so you know you're going to be we're going to ruin your reputation so that's uh, one of the big changes over the past year that uh, that ransomware is is doing and if again referring back to the colonial pipeline uh, ransomware that there is rumors that the um, colonial just actually paid the ransom to get that they supposedly they said we didn't need to, but for for timing purposes, we have or we just decided to pay them between four and five million dollars, which um, you know that's got organizations like the FBI and and people cringing because they think it's going to make things worse, and we'll see continue to see more ransomware. But um, separate of the uh, analysis on um, Colonial Verizon is is saying that ransomware is likely to rise. Uh, this was the, the next point is a, a very interesting tidbit there that 85% of breaches involved a human element, which leads to the next one. Phishing is again on the rise. All of these are a little bit related because you can't have can't have a human element without, you know, talking about social engineering, which is, you know, people doing pretexting and figuring out ways into your physical location or coming in logically through a phishing um, email or the next one, 61% of breaches involving credential data, you know, stealing credentials, name and password. So all those two, three and four are all pretty closely related. And then this, uh, that fifth bad news takeaway is it continues to be the case that if you have a client facing website, Hackers are gonna they're gonna spend some time trying to trying to get into that um, that web web application and actually 80% of this year's studied breaches on DBIR were a result of a, a web um, getting into the website. Um, did have a little bit of good news. Errors were less of a problem. This that's kind of a um, good news but it's not really good news. I mean, percentage wise, it went down, but actually if you if you dig into the detailed report, you'll find out that there were actually more errors 
this year than last year. But statistically, percentage-wise, it went down. And for the last three years, we've had at least um, stay constant on the percentage or or go up. So that did actually drop down by five percentage points. And that's things like um, configuration errors where where people just you know don't don't put the right configurations in, and, and or they make a mistake on doing things. And um, so that that reflects back to some of the errors would be figured out in that uh, 86% involving uh, human error. Um, actually, compromises on desktops and laptops declined. A um, big reason why this is, is because everybody's moving towards the cloud, um, social media, web application vectors are, are getting attacked more than, uh, than the, the local laptop or desktops. And then we had 14% of breaches have zero dollar impact where they, I'm not sure if I would go to the bank and say, hey, I don't have to worry about cybersecurity because 14% of the breaches didn't uh, in, involve a dollar or not. I, I find, I'm scratching my head about that as to why the Verizon even reported that or how they got to the data below that because I went out to a, a secondary source, which You've heard of the Ponymon Institute, which usually does a survey annually in coordination with IBM. And their average breach cost for last year was $8.6 million. And then um, Verizon came up and said that 95% of breaches range from 800 and some dollars to almost $700,000. So I'm like, I'm questioning whether that I have to do some more digging on that because it doesn't seem to uh, hold water as to why why that um, last good good point would be up there. And then lastly, on the the takeaways, we have um, last year we talked about how it was more likely for a large business to be attacked than to for a smaller medium sized business. Um, so this is kind of a bad news situation for some of us out there that are running smaller, medium-sized businesses. The gap between those two categories is much smaller this year, um, and that the top, top attack patterns are very much aligned. So they're, what that means is they're just using the same attack patterns, and they're just running it, and they're not just saying we're going to focus on large businesses, we're going to go large or small, and wherever we can find the weakness, we're going to attack it, we're going to go through that door. And um, lastly, large businesses, typically 55% find a, a breach in days or less, and where a small or medium businesses, there's only 40-some percent of the uh, businesses that find their breach in days or less. And that goes back to a cybersecurity term called dwell time. And what dwell time is, it's the average number of days that people are on your computer system before you discover and you find out that you're on their computer system. So a, a big thing to do to make sure you're, you're not a victim of dwell time is uh, using your system logs to monitor what's going on and you can look at your logs and try to figure out, you, you should be able to tell the people who are in your system. So that's a, a key uh, control that you can, you can use. And that takes us to our next um, checkpoint question. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Uh -huh. 
Okay, thanks. All right, so let's, uh, um, for the last um, 15 minutes or so of the presentation before we go to Q&A, uh, I'll talk about some of the um, industry highlights. Now this, um, we'll go into a few different uh, detail slides here. This is um, our uh, attack pattern summary. So this is like, these are the seven patterns that were, were changed on the report from uh, 21 to, from 20 to 21, I should say. So these were the same six industries that I reported on last year. And unfortunately, they did not provide detail um, analysis for some of the other um, categories that I was reporting on for construction or transportation. So, um, so you'll see that this is the uh, only one I could do apples to apples to uh, 2020. But um, what I've done is, is highlighted the uh, top four um, <clears throat> attack vectors that are being that were being used and are considered probable from um, the Verizon DVR point of view. So the, the key that I would look at here is that those bottom three are pretty standard across all six of these industries and they even carry out to some of the other of the, you know, the 14 additional industries. Social engineering was probably the top, which goes in alignment with some um, what everything was being said last year about COVID, where because of COVID and the remote workforces, everybody was moving from being in office to being remote. And so phishing, phishing scams were greatly in, improving because the, uh, the hackers were figuring out that it was a pretty, like, pretty easy um, approach. Also, I, I talked earlier about if you have a web-facing application that, um, you know, the hackers are going to eventually give that, just kick the tires and see how secure it is and see if they can get in. Um, so those bottom three, uh, and what the, if it's an X, it's one of the top three, and I put the asterisk for the um, the number four in that particular industry. So you can see that um, healthcare, with healthcare being a top four for the, the six industries, that social engineering is, on every single one of those industries. And that's one of the um, areas that it suggests looking at for the uh, all 20 of the industries, as well as web applications are being targeted by virtually every industry as well. So, so those are those are two, two of the, I would look at all these areas, but those are two social engineering and web uh, applications are definitely something that's Along with system intrusion, that could be uh, could be an Achilles heel for you. And then moving on to our actor motives, as you can see that um, the report, I talk about 20, 20 industries that highlighted 12 of the 20, and unfortunately, um, the construction and transportation dropped off. They didn't. They highlighted those in 2021 and or 2020 and not in 2021. So what I've done here is like this chart is showing you why hackers are coming after different industries. And again, when we talked earlier about that they want they want to get um, make a financial gain or it's it's done by internal or actually I should say external members of the, uh, the hacking community. Um, but espionage, you can look at that. It's uh, basically single digits in all the uh, industries that I've I've highlighted here based on our audience. Um, interesting also that you've got a category of um, fun and a category of grudge. So it's like people are just doing this for fun. It's a hobby for some people, especially in the healthcare industry, and in that if you're in the financial or manufacturing industries, you got to worry about uh, people holding a grudge against you, whether that's a current employee getting you from the internal side or whether that's uh, someone that just left your company and they're deciding to come back and um, um, try to wreak havoc on you. But again, it's um, a financial gain is look at those high numbers up in the uh, over 90% on all of them. 
in that, which could, again, 86% of all breaches across all industries are committed because they wanted to, to, to make some money at it. And then the, this talking about the threat actors, these all pretty much moved in the direction of went from last year, they were usually had a higher internal number, but these are all moving towards the external, moving up a lot. And you can see that the retail, that's a, a big chunk there, the highest number and um, finan financial insurance is the lowest number. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit again about the webinar last month and um, and go through some of the things how the DBIR can help you help you with your risk assessment. So if, if you remember last last month or if you didn't attend it and you want to get a copy of that, just um, send me an email, send an email to uh, webinar at uh, hbkcpa.com either way and we can send you a copy the slide deck from the uh, doing a risk assessment or you can get the recording. Just uh, let me know. But there's two um, two steps that specifically we talked about. We went through a five-step process for conducting a risk assessment of which step two was um, identifying the risks, which you're going to go through and do a process of trying to identify the threats, which uh, you're exposed to and the vulnerabilities, which um, make it likely that a threat could be acted upon. So that definitely, you can go through the, the DBIR um, findings and, and help to determine what your threats are based on your industry and where your vulnerabilities are. Again, it's not trying to make a prediction because if you, if you think about it, nobody could have really predicted that we'd have the 2020 we had with the um, COVID. So nobody, you know, would have predicted anything like that. But so you're not predicting; you're just looking at what's more probable, and you're figuring out how to allocate those budget dollars. And then, secondly, when you do your risk analysis, where you're going to try to do some type of um, objective calculation with, like, a, we suggest impact versus likelihood. You know, the Verizon report can help you determine what the uh, what the likelihood of those uh, particular risks occurring. So this is uh, DBIR is a, is a good input to help you out with your with creating your own risk assessment process. And then we'll go into some of the uh, recommendations for mitigating risk from the 2021 report. And so again, the, the DBIR is, this is the second year where they've um, standardized on what's referred to as the CIS um, controls. CIS is just a, uh, a term for um, the Center for Internet Security. And previously, this is uh, put out by an organization called the uh, SANS Institute. And it used to be called uh, the CIS top 20, but similar to the Verizon folks with their DBIR making their pattern changes, the um, Center, Center for Internet Security must have had a lot of time on their hands based on COVID. So they decided that they were no longer going to have 20 controls. They were just going to have 18. So I haven't seen any statistics as to whether they've changed it to the um, whether you can um, do an internet search on CIS top 18 and come up with that, but you can definitely just go to the SANS Institute or the um, Center for Internet Security and you can pull these, pull the latest version and it's free, but you have to uh, register first and then they send you a link with the email. Um, as long as you're not doing any consulting for other organizations, you can get this information free and like I said, go for version eight and it's going to break down these top 18 controls and it gives you sub controls in each of the 18 layers as far as how you can implement um, protection. So it's a very, um, very worthwhile source as well as 
CIS is going to do cross references to other things like NIST. So if you might be doing NIST CSS as a framework or go into ISAC as COBIT, you can um, get that cross references from the CIS, a very valuable um, tool to use. Uh, moving on with uh, mitigations. So again, on the, um, the featured industries and in comparison to what we did last year, so finance, health, manufacturing, retail, all of those had the same three, top three CIS uh, controls. Um, should be CIS, not CSC. Um, but um, so the first one being number four, attempts to reduce your errors, which we talked earlier, errors were a big reason why um, why breaches happen. So again, it could be misconfigurations, being able to remotely wipe a device is a, is a control that mitigates that. Uh, six talks about access control management, which is trying to prevent the people from stealing login credentials, which we talked earlier about credentials being one of the areas that, that's jumped up big time, as well as 14, and this is very similar. A lot of these controls were also on the 2020 report, but CSC 14 is probably the biggest um, thing that I think people can do is um, do a security awareness training along with um, phishing samples. That was across the board. I think every single industry had a recommendation to do more uh, security information training, security awareness training, I should say. And that, and so the the top top three controls across all industries, if you look at it, ends up being the same three. And again, number one comes in very handy to try to prevent web attacks. And I told you that web applications were a primary reason why people were coming, getting in and breaching systems. Second one for access control deals with, with the credentials and then the security awareness with, you know, phishing and um, social engineering. Then we're at our last um, checkpoint question. Okay, and I think that since this that was our last um, uh, actual real question, then Michelle, I think we have the one to just whether they want. Um, quite, yes, there it is. So Michelle's got that up on the screen. So if you do want CPE credits, all you have to do is say yes, and we'll uh, we'll get you a certificate out. And if you're either if you don't want it, you can say no or or just. Don't answer the question. If you don't have, if you haven't been answering the CPE questions, then you can just continue uh, not answering. But if you do want C CPE, excuse me, just please answer yes there, and we'll get you a certificate. Okay, let's go ahead and, and wrap up. Um, I think we have just a, um, we have about, you know, a few minutes here. We've got uh, five to 10 minutes that we were looking forward to uh, to answer questions. So, so at this point, if, um, Michelle, do we have any questions? And I'll, I'll try to address them. If we don't get to, if we run out of time and we don't get to your question and you submitted one, don't worry, we will, um, we have your email address. And we'll uh, answer that um, directly and uh, either call you or send you an email. 
um, regarding a question. Yes, we did get a couple questions uh, submitted. The first question is, are a majority of the web, web applications being hacked into involving SQL injections? Um, that wasn't specified in the, um, in the DBIR, but I would say that that's, that's typically one of the, uh, the main attack vectors that are used. Um, so I can't say 100% based on what's in the Verizon report, but uh, definitely a SQL injection is something that you need to be cognizant of. And for those of you that aren't, aren't aware of, of what that is, it's, it's basically you just, um, you have coding within your web application or your web facing um, application that it's not specifically, there's secure coding techniques which, which would prevent a SQL injection attack, but really it's just tricking the, tricking the application slash database where you put a, a code in that, that's asking it to dump data out of the, uh, the SQL database and it just, the application doesn't know how to handle it, so it just dumps all the information out and, and hackers get your information that way. So I would, I would definitely um, recommend secure coding techniques and you can look at the, um, there's a, it's called WASP for the, um, which is a free thing where you can go out and talk and it talks about the different secure coding techniques you can use. So I would, I would definitely try to prevent um, the SQL injection, but it, the, this year's report did not specifically talk about that as being one of the uh, web application attacks that they were seeing. Okay, the next question is, since my company has a limited budget, what is the best preventative control to implement? Um, so that, like what came out in, in this year's DBIR was the, um, again, that uh, social engineering was a, a real big attack vector. So it, based on a limited budget, I would say that definitely look in the area of security awareness and, train, and training. Um, and then if you still have any anything left in the uh, in the bank account, I would definitely look into vulnerability scanning because keeping in mind that I, I've said multiple times that hackers are a lazy group of people, but um, so what they're going to do is they're going to run vulnerability scans on on systems and they're going to be looking for people that haven't patched their systems. So if you're not doing the vulnerability scanning the hackers are going to do vulnerability scanning for you, but they're not going to be nice enough to tell you, hey, you got to fix this. You got to go out and patch this uh, vulnerability. They're just going to try to exploit that and see what they can do to make a financial gain. So again, I would say definitely focus number one on security awareness training, and then number two would be vulnerability scanning. Okay, the next question that came in is, can you tell us more about the CIS Top 18. Um, yeah, that, like I said, I, when, I, when I talked about that previously, they previously were the CIS Top 20, and they uh, consolidated their, uh, their set down just by two down to 18. But again, it's, it's free, it's updated annually, and uh, like version eight is the most recent version and it does provide cross references to the other control frameworks so it's a, I look at it as a very valuable tool I um, I actually download that on an annual basis just to just to have that as a reference we internally here we follow on uh, the NIST CSS but um, I do look at the um, the CIS top 18 uh, to you know just to look at multiple frameworks and provide some uh, cross references and um, sanity checks to say, you know, what am I sure that what um, NIST is saying? If I, if I want to get some clarification, I'll look at the CIS and it, it gives you a good um, comparison there and so you can feel confident that you're doing the, putting the right controls in place. Okay, the next question is, does HBK offer any services to help companies protect against the cyber threats reported in the 2020 
CBIR? Um, actually, so they probably meant to say 2021, but again, again, when the previous question was, or our question, earlier question was, what, what do we focus on based on our budget? And I said, um, security awareness training, as well as vulnerability scanning. And we actually, HBK actually offers packages where we can do a combination of both of those. Um, vulnerability scanning between allocating between internal and external scans, being that you're looking uh, internally or just what's what's accessible externally, which we do on a monthly basis. Typically, do internals based on a quarterly basis, and then we do uh, in uh, monthly quarterly or monthly phishing tests, which um, those are those are huge, and, that, and we, we so we've got package deals that can uh, pretty economically priced to to help people out with those. If you're interested, just um, you know shoot me an email, and we can uh, we can uh, schedule a call, and we can talk more about that. Okay, another question that just came in is, what takeaway from this year's report did you find the most interesting? Um, probably, it just, uh, for me, it's more of, it's, um, I don't know if I'd say interesting, but it just gives me comfort that I'm focusing on the right things. It's, in other words, you know, I've, everybody probably on this call is is probably thinking some of the same things where um that people are moving from on premises to the cloud and it um it just basically gives you some comfort that you're um um doing the right thing and uh so it it, it confirms that the hackers are know that everybody's migrating to the cloud and they're moving in that direction as well as the gives you a confirmation that you need to do the uh, security awareness training and that credentials are um, getting um, getting stolen and people are being tricked into giving up their credentials by a lot of the phishing emails. Um, and then um, it's it probably, I think it, um, one of the things that I, one of the thoughts that I have after reading the DBIR is that um, it, it probably makes sense to have an upcoming webinar as far as, you know, I, I get asked a lot, is my um, cloud vendor secure? So it's, um, I think it might be a good, so I'd be interested if anybody, we have, we sent a, an email out to get some feedback on the this webinar. So if, if you do have a chance to fill that out, maybe um, make a suggestion as to whether you think um, a webinar topic of, um, how to how to figure out if your cloud cloud provider is secure would be a good topic. So um, those are probably the biggest takeaways that I find is that you know confirms that you know the cloud is a reality and that credentials are getting stolen frequently. And um, those are probably the two biggest takeaways I would say from um, from this year's report that would be classified as interesting. Do we have any other questions, Michelle, or is that? That was all for right now. Okay. All right, again, um, I wanna thank everybody for attending the uh, webinar. Hope you, hopefully you found it uh, interesting and uh, worthwhile. And uh, we'll be sending out um, a, a link with the, um, the I think we'll have a, it has a slide deck and it'll have the recording as well as um, give you some option for, for feedback. And uh, we, all, we always do these webinars on the uh, fourth Wednesday of the month. So if you want to hold the date, um, our next webinar in June will be on the 23rd, again at noon. And the plan will be to, uh, to offer CP at that. So if you have any questions that didn't get answered or or the conversation spurred another thought and you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and um, I'll, I'll address your questions. And thanks again for attending and everybody have a great afternoon. Thanks.